Vicki and I have had the extraordinary joy of a grandchild, a, a new grandchild. We have four now all together. And um, little Victoria, uh, we, we babysit her every Friday. And, um, and it is, it's, uh, she's really made her way into our hearts in a huge way. And, um, and it's been a joy, but I'm reminded by this little teeny baby of the helplessness of a baby. And she is totally 100% helpless. There's not a thing she can do for herself. And um, as we're holding her and feeding her and changing her and, and uh, listening to her scream and cry sometimes, um, whatever, but, um, and even laugh. I mean, she, she's laughing now and be becoming much more expressive. I'm really excited that I have this person that'll think I'm funny for two years. <laughs> And, um, but anyways, um, but I'm reminded that, you know, that's the way Jesus Christ came into the world. He was totally helpless. He was this little teeny baby. He started his life helpless and he ended his life helpless on the cross and, um, and weak. And that really reveals something to us about the heart of God, doesn't it? God is revealing something of who he is to us in that helpless little infant. And on the cross of Jesus Christ, God is saying, this is, this is part of my heart. You're seeing something of who I am. Lowly, humble, and meek. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I think that's exciting. And I'm gonna um, go in a little bit of a different direction today. We're gonna put, um, we're, we're gonna go and push pause on the Book of Romans right now. <laughs> and, um, and this is just something that's on my heart about the good news that Jesus Christ brings us, as well as um, really when you read some, a narrative out of scripture, it can drive home some of the truths that we read and parts of scripture like Ephesians, like Romans, like Galatians. And so we're going to be looking at just a couple passages of scripture. To start us out, we're gonna to go to Matthew in chapter four, just for a little bit. Matthew chapter four. Last week I had read a, a statement about, or no, excuse me, it wasn't last week here, it was at the Bible study on Wednesday as we've been looking at the doctrine of assurance. We were looking at John's gospel and I don't know about anybody else who was there, but it was thrilling. It was just thrilling for me to be reading simple passages about eternal life in Jesus Christ. And just, it was so refreshing. And um, we mentioned how Jesus is the light John chapter one mentions how he's the true light that having come into the world gives light to all men and that, that no one has been able, that, excuse me, that the darkness has not been able to overpower the light. No matter how much people rejected Jesus Christ, he's the light of the world. And he declares that in, in um, John chapter eight, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. And in John chapter one, verse five, that He's the light that, and the darkness has not overcome the light that has come into this world. So this, this metaphor of light, this imagery of light that John the Apostle uses, um, he uses it in his gospel, he uses it in his epistles, his first epistle that, um, that we even walk in that light that Jesus has brought, the light of truth and life. And in here, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning with verse 12, at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, after his temptations in the wilderness, so Matthew 4, beginning with verse 12, it says, Now when he heard that John, that's Jesus, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali 
so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus comes into, he leaves Nazareth, and he'll come into Capernaum. And Capernaum, which means um, the town of Nahum, Caper Nahum, um, the prophet Nahum, is on the north, kind of the north, north, west part of the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus is going to make that um, fisherman's town his, really his home base, where he'll have much of his ministry as well as spreading out from there. But he'll often come back to there. It's believed to be the home of Peter the Apostle as well. So Jesus Christ will make that his home base. But as he comes to dwell there, it says the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light it kind of confirms a little bit of what i was saying last week about the world that we live in is often a very dark place and he does and he comes into the darkness that people experience in this world in sickness and in disease and as it says for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them a light has dawned. And as we prayed before for Linda's family, her family has, has seen a lot of that in the last year, in the last couple of years. They've had to walk through a long and dark shadow of death. But Jesus Christ comes to bring light to the situation. He comes to bring hope and life. And we're going to see that in a, in a few moments how he does it in such a real way. I love reading this scripture because it's, it's so it so clearly depicts the ministry of Jesus Christ and the hope that he brings to, the, to this world. It's a realistic picture of the world as well. He comes to bring light for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death. On them a light has dawned and next i'd like to go to luke luke's gospel and that's where we will read our final passages and um one of the things that we will know we're going to be in luke chapter 4 initially then we'll go to luke chapter 7 but initially luke chapter 4 and um we remember part of the Christmas story, and this will be what I'm going to be sharing next week about the shepherds out in the field and how a great light shined upon them from heaven. And uh, once again, piercing the darkness, this imagery, this metaphor of more than just a metaphor in this case, but enhances the metaphor of light coming into a dark world. But in chapter 4... In beginning with verse 16, it says, And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. 
And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This passage that's quoted here in verses 18 and 19 is taken from Isaiah chapter 61. And Isaiah 61 reads just a teeny bit different and it has the words also to heal the brokenhearted, which the King James and New King James translations have in their translation to carry for, forward that passage. So Jesus is saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news or glad tidings to the poor, to the destitute. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Otherwise, to be light, to bring hope, and to bring salvation, Jesus Christ has come into the world to be that light, to be life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. So Jesus Christ comes to bring life, to bind up, to heal the, those who are brokenhearted. And many of these brokenhearted are living in a shadow of death, a valley overshadowed by death. He comes to bring light and hope in the midst of darkness. Jesus Christ, his ministry is to bring salvation. Also in Luke's gospel, Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Also to Simeon, when Jesus is presented in the temple, Simeon holds that little baby in his hand and says, Now, Lord, you can let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He is a light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And when he says you're the glory, that he, this baby, this child, is the glory of your people Israel, what he is saying is that all of the promises of God, like the one we read in Isaiah chapter 2, find their fulfillment in this little baby, this child who is my Savior, the salvation of Israel. But he's a light to the Gentiles, which is why in Isaiah chapter 2, as we read this morning, the Gentile nations will all go up to Jerusalem where the people of God gather together. When we were studying Psalms at, in our, at our Wednesday night Bible study, which was a fascinating study, I think we really enjoyed that as we went through many different Psalms. One of the themes that we saw in the book of Psalms is the, the, the theme of the temple. Like Psalm 84, for example, how amiable are thy dwellings, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. And um, this, the psalmist cries out as to when can I return to that? That's where I want to be. Why did he want to be in the temple? Because that's where the people of God gather together. Not just, not just because the temple was pretty. And yes, certainly because the presence of the Lord was there, uniquely there, but the people of God gathered together and they would celebrate their great salvation. They would hear the word of God read. They would sing songs and psalms together. And so that's a big theme that we see in the book of Psalms. Whenever you're reading Psalms and you see the longing in the heart of the psalmist to return to Jerusalem and to the temple, it's because he's a part of a covenant people that belong to each other and that worship the Lord together and the Lord covers them with his presence. And that's where in the Holy of Holies, the Lord's presence is uniquely and where he reigns as king over the earth. Praise God, that whole imagery of reigning as king. They want to be where God is. Well, when it talks in Isaiah, what we read at the beginning of the nations coming to that temple in Jerusalem, it's, it's all the peoples of the nations, as I shared before, becoming one family, one people of God, because that's where the light of the Lord is. That's where the salvation of God is. That's where the people of God gather together. 
So now chapter 7, and this is the main passage we're looking at, and we won't need to spend much time here. It's a shorter passage, but it's very powerful. Jesus Christ and his ministry. It's interesting, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke gives more attention to women and the ministry of women than any of the other Gospel writers. It was Luke that points out the fact that a, a widow in the temple put in two little copper coins, and that was all that she had to live on, but she gave it. It was Luke that talks about Anna at the beginning of the gospel who sees the baby Jesus and then speaks out and prophesies there concerning this, or speaks many things concerning this little child, that she lived in the temple day and night and had been living in fastings and prayers and ministering to the Lord. So Jesus, um, excuse me, Luke in this gospel shows the relationship that Jesus has with women. And here's one in particular, starting with verse 11, where we see a widow once again. And this is the only gospel that carries this particular account. It says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the, the bear, or the beer, I'm not really sure, that's the coffin. And the bears stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. I can imagine. So Jesus Christ is coming to a town called Nain with his disciples and the usual big crowd that seems to be following after Jesus. As they're coming to the city gates, there's a funeral procession. Uh, the, 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 the coffin would have been not anything closed like we would have today. It was more like a, a pallet um, that you would carry somebody on. And, and um, what's interesting here is as Jesus and his disciples are coming in and this procession is coming out, the widow most likely is in the front of that procession. And I think the reason why she was is actually sad and only adds to her grief. In that, at that time period in Israel, it was believed that because of Eve partaking of the fruit first in the garden, it was believed that therefore death came into the world by the woman. Of course, we know from the book of Romans that really it's the sin of Adam that brings death to the world. But anyways, it's, they were both in it, but the woman was deceived. Adam was calculatingly defiant. He was a rebel. But because it's believed that death came into the world by the woman, when there was a funeral procession, a woman had to lead the procession to the grave, which was actually pretty shameful for the women. Women were marginalized in that culture, which is why what we see this relationship that Jesus has with women is radical. It really was radical. Not that he was trying to be radical. That was never the goal of Jesus, to try to be radical. Jesus Christ came to bring life and restoration, to turn around the curse and to bring the blessing of God. That's why we have 
Martha and Mary and how Mary sits at the feet of Jesus while he's teaching, people, that was unheard of in that culture. Only men sat at the feet of a rabbi to learn, not the woman, women. But Mary knows there's something so different about Jesus, so welcoming about Jesus. He came to turn everything around and upside down because the world had been turned upside down by the curse. And Jesus comes to bring restoration and light and hope and salvation. So this woman, Mary, finds the, 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 the freedom to sit at his feet and to learn. Of course, that makes Martha a little upset because she's saying, why am I doing all the work and Mary's not helping? But Jesus said to Martha, you know, you're worried about many things, but actually Mary has chosen the better part. She's chosen something precious and it will not, Jesus said, be taken away from her. So widow, widows were marginalized, or women were, but widows in particular, widows were unable to care for themselves. They were dependent upon others. This widow would have been totally dependent upon her son to take care of her. And now her son dies. I wonder if Jesus, and sometimes when you read these, these narratives, you, you, you really need to engage your imagination a little bit. You've got to see Jesus in this crowd coming forward and, and then this pr funeral procession. You know, Jesus knows that his own mother is going to be facing within a year or two the tremendous amount of grief as he's put to death himself. But the Bible says here that Jesus was moved by compassion when he saw this widow. He knew her pain. He, that was her only son. Whether, whether somehow he knew that by the Spirit of God or had been familiar with the person, we don't really know. But he was moved by compassion for this woman whose only son had died. And he's moved by compassion. He says to the woman, don't weep. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a statement I, I can't imagine... You go up to tell somebody at a funeral, don't cry, you know. But I'm quite sure what he said and the way he said it was filled with hope. I'm, I'm here. She would have recognized him as a rabbi. Maybe she knew of the ministry of Jesus Christ. We don't know. But she would have recognized him by his clothing that he was a rabbi. And there's all these crowds and disciples following him. I don't know. That would have made me a little uncomfortable, I think, to see a crowd coming toward me. But Jesus comes up to her and says, don't weep. I come to bring you light. I come to bring light to your dark situation. I'm a light that shines in the shadow of death. I come, I bring hope in what seems to be a totally hopeless situation. And it would have been for her, losing her son, being a widow at that time. But Jesus says, don't cry, don't weep. And then what Jesus done, does next is interesting. First of all, one more thing I wanted to say about her, about Jesus saying, do not weep. It says in verse 13, and when the Lord saw her, his eyes made that connection. He saw her. What did he see in the midst of a huge crowd? He saw an individual. He saw a person. He didn't see... He, he didn't see somebody in such a way that he wanted him out of the way because, that, well, that's a woman, that's a widow, and, um, you know, she's marginalized and all that. No, he saw the person. You know that what good news that is to know that Jesus Christ looks at us and sees the person. He sees you and he sees me. That brings tremendous joy to my heart to know that even when I'm struggling profoundly or whatever, that Jesus sees me and he sees my heart here. He sees her. He's moved by compassion. He says, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the, the coffin that he was lying on. Now, in that, in Judaism, according to the law of Moses, to come into contact with something dead with an animal or a human being would make you ritually unclean. So that Jesus Christ, a, a rabbi, there's no way in the world a rabbi would go up and touch a corpse or a casket. No way. 
And yet Jesus just goes up there and touches that. I, 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 once again, if we use our imaginations a little bit, there must have been a, like a gasp maybe in the crowd. There must have been like, whoa, you know, what's, what's this rabbi doing here? He, he's no relation. It's, he's not part of the procession. He just walks over and he touches, touches it. But the interesting thing about Jesus is many times he will touch things or people that would make him unclean. Like when he embraces the, the, the leper. To touch a leper would make you ritually unclean. You, you couldn't be part of the worship community. You couldn't go to the temple. And you couldn't be having much contact with anybody else because they wouldn't want to get ritually unclean. But there's something about Jesus. He touches a leper and what happens? He doesn't become unclean. The leper becomes clean. The leper is made clean. He's totally healed. Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't become unclean by touching the corpse. Jesus gives life. He, it's just the opposite. Life comes out from him. Clean cleanliness comes out from him. Purity comes from him. He can't be made unclean. And so when Jesus comes to you and to me, he takes our uncleanness upon himself, not becoming unclean, but giving us purity. So the bearer stood still when Jesus came up and touched the coffin. I imagine he would have met the woman first and said, don't weep. Then would have walked past, I don't know, other people perhaps, and then coming to the coffin, touching that. And the, the bearers of it would stand still. And then Jesus does this. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. What a word of command and power. This man was dead, which means his heart was not beating. The brain waves weren't there anymore. There was no flow of blood whatsoever. The man was dead. Yikes. And Jesus says, young man, which means perhaps the widow was a younger widow and her son was somewhat young. It appears that way from saying young man. And all he had to do was speak and say, I say to you, arise. What authority and power that is, but that's our savior. That's the light that shines in the dark. That's the comfort he comes to bring. He can speak to somebody and bring them to life. No other can do that. When I was um, preaching the funeral of Vicki's mom and reading from and quoting the John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I said this, I said, Jesus Christ is the only one who has ever said that. I am the resurrection and the life. You see, only one. And then I said this, he's the only one that could ever say it. There's no other that could say that. There's no angel that can say that. There's no guru that can say that. Muhammad couldn't say that. Buddha couldn't say that. There is no religious leader anywhere, no mystic anywhere that can say that. Only Jesus Christ not only can say, I am the resurrection and I am the light. But then he can walk up to the grave of Lazarus, who had been dead and buried four days. Yikes. <laughs> and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Wow. Jesus comes to bring light into a dark place. The living God himself tabernacled in flesh and walked in the midst of people to bring hope, to bring light. And in the face of the greatest enemy of man, death itself, he simply speaks and says, young man, 
arise. And the dead man sat up and began speaking. I wish, I wish Luke would have included a little bit more. It'd be interesting to interview that person and <laughs> to see what he had to say. But he began to speak. And then Jesus, what does Jesus do? It says Jesus gave him back to his mother. Probably meaning Jesus presented him back to his mother and says, here's your son. But when you think about it, Jesus gave her his son, didn't, didn't he? That's not the only new life we see here. Not only is the son alive, but this woman has new life. This rabbi loved and cared enough in that society at that time to just love her, to come up to her and to say, don't weep than to go over to her only son, raise him up and say, I give him back to you. This is a rabbi that, that taught, that preached, that performed miracles, that loved her and gave her her life and her son back. My, that's powerful. That's why the people sitting in darkness have seen a great light. And what an understatement that is, a great light. Light is so much greater than that, a great light. And then fear seized them all. <laughs> I, I believe that they were shaken with fear. That's what it says. It's like the disciples on the boat when Jesus calmed the sea. They were, they were so afraid that they were going to die that they, they were actually terrorized. And they go and wake up Jesus and say, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus stands up and, and he commands the great tempest to become. And then it says the disciples are filled with fear, great fear, because there's this, there's this man who just stood up and commanded wind and waves to come, and they did. He just commands it and it happens. Now they're filled with, with dread and with fear, saying, what manner of man is this? Who is this? It was totally out of all of their categories. Totally out of all of their categories of what people are. I was listening to, um, to R.C. Sproul preaching one time about how we put everybody into a category. When you see somebody, let's say you're meeting somebody for the first time, you kind of scan them, you know, and you're already in your mind, you're kind of characterizing them or interpreting them and maybe categorizing them like, this seems like a nice person. This seems like a hard, a hard uh, working, but maybe an athlete or something. We, we categorize immediately. But how do you categorize somebody who just stood up and commanded the wind to be still and the waves to be calm? They were filled with fear, it says. Who is this? What manner of man is this? It says the people here just saw a dead man come back to life at the command of this rabbi. And they said... They, a great fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding countryside. Wow. There's a tremendous, tremendous application in this to all of us. When we... When we come here to worship when we pray at home and we talk to the Lord this is the Jesus that we're talking to this is the Jesus that we worship the one who says young man arise and a dead man comes back to life one who calms the wind and the waves one who cleanses a leper one who refuses all the mores of that culture and will go up and touch the leprous. will sit down with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. Sit down with them and just treat them as human beings and love them. When it says Jesus touched the leper in the Greek language brings out the idea he grabbed a hold of. He did more than just touch. He, he grabbed a hold of this man. Grabbed a hold of him. Lepers were 
People ran from lepers. If you were a leper, you had to scream out if you were coming into any public area. A leper, you had to let them all know so they could all clear the road. Nobody wanted to touch you. You were unclean, both ritually and plus it's contagious. It was believed. But Jesus walks right up to this guy and grabs a hold of him. He says, be clean. Jesus goes beyond all cat categories, but he's our savior. He's the one that we're putting our trust in. We're not putting our trust in just some great philosopher, a great moral or ethical teacher, somebody who's came, who has come with a social gospel just to change society and to make the world a nicer place. We come to one who is a great light, who brings hope in the midst of the deepest darkness, the darkness of death itself. Someday there will be no more death, for Jesus Christ has overcome death and has promised us that he will end all of death. Jesus himself in John's Gospel, chapter 6, said a day is going to come when every single person who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man and will come out of their graves. That's when he'll do everybody at once. <laughs> this is one person. But this is the Jesus, this is the Jesus that we worship, the one who is compassionate, the one who sees the woman, sees the one person, connects with her, sees her, touches her, tells her not to weep, raises her son, restores her life in the process. He's the one who's totally approachable, who's, who's merciful and who is kind who is loving, who cares, who puts up no barriers, who's totally approachable, which is why people can come up to him and touch him and surround him and follow him. He's a rabbi. He's a rabbi that they can actually approach. Praise God. And that's our savior. And so I hope we can take this to heart. This is a strong message in Luke's gospel here, in the raising of this widow's son. Read it often, meditate on it. Use your imagination a little bit. Try to picture what that must have looked like. What that must have looked like to have this rabbi who looked just as human as everybody else. I've said this often and I'll say it again. If you would have gone back in time and lined up 15 males, 15 rabbis, and say, now, which one is Jesus? You wouldn't know. <laughs> you wouldn't know. Why? Well, because he was just a man. He didn't have blue eyes and blonde hair and was really taller than everybody else. No, he, he was a Jewish man of that time. And there was nothing in him that would have drawn us to him in natural beauty, according to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52. There's nothing that would have made us draw to him other than, of course, the Spirit of God and who he was in his person. But this man just walked up and raised this, this rabbi walks up and just raises this man from the dead. That's the Jesus you can go home and talk to during the week. That's the Jesus who walks with us. That's the Jesus who is a light that the darkness cannot overpower, ever. He is the one who came out of that grave when he tasted death for himself in our behalf and was raised from the dead. Jesus says in the, on the Isle of Patmos to John the Apostle, after John falls to the ground like a dead man, seeing the glorified Christ, Jesus says to fear not. He says to John, you know what he does actually? He walks over to John and touches him. And he says, fear not. I am he that liveth, I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of Hades and of death. Wow, I am he that liveth. John, don't be afraid. I was dead, but I am alive forevermore. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Praise God. That is a light. That is a light that shines in a dark place. That is why we sing joy to the world. It's because of this, this person, this wonderful Savior. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for who Jesus is. 
This Jesus who speaks to a dead man, simply saying, arise, and the man comes back to life. He also speaks. He says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. We can trust the words that come out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we long to know your presence, to feel your touch, to know your forgiveness, to feel your warm tears in our grief. Oh Lord, how often have our paths been, the grass upon our paths made green by the tears you suffer for our pain in your compassion, in your love, and in your grace, and in your tenderness. Oh, as your word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the one who puts their trust in him. Jesus calls every one of us here to taste and to see how good, how tender, how caring, and how compassionate, how loving, you are. We worship you, Lord Jesus Christ, our King. Amen.